Okay, um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to um, the webinar on importance of financial modeling, model audit and review. My name is Leanne Kiriro, and I am the marketing and communications lead for Investia Africa. And I will start the program and then I will um, hand over the session to Stephen Gugu, who will be our moderator for today. Um, so just a run of the program. Um, so we'll start with the introduction of Investia, then uh, introduction of the speakers. Then we'll go to the panel uh, discussion. And then from there, we'll have questions from the audience. All right. Um, just to note that this uh, session is recorded. And therefore, we'll just uh, share this with you. Um, with a recording with you after the session. So Investor is a boutique uh, project and corporate uh, finance adv advisory company. Uh, we have experience working with projects and entrepreneurs in various sectors, uh, including fast moving uh, consumer goods, power utilities, airport infrastructure, manufacturing and real estate. Uh, Investor has experience in both project uh, consulting solutions in feasible appraisals, financial structures and capital raising. Um, we use the FAST standard in our modeling. And uh, um, as you can see on the right side of your screen um, that our, our services include financial modeling training, capital raising, uh, policy work and project, uh, project and corporate finance advisory. So we also do review models and that's why we put together this um, this uh, webinar. So this is our select assignment track record, and you can, as you can see, we have worked in energy. And we have worked with various um, companies in that sector. Um, we have worked in also FMCG. Um, we have done a little bit of livestock export, renewable energy. Um, um, tech based transport solution um, that's quadrate. Uh, fuel software um, systems, and then uh, mobile software, just to mention a few. And those are your contacts. Uh, if you need to reach us, you can go to our website. Uh, that, does, that is www.investor.com and, uh, and or email us on info at investor.com. You can also uh, view us on our social media pages um, on LinkedIn and Instagram. And that's our phone number on the screen as well if you need to call us. Um, so without further much ado, I'm going to invite um, Stephen Gugu, who's going to, who's our principal at Investor Africa, to introduce the team as well as, um, in, to introduce himself, sorry, as well as the team. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lian, for that uh, introduction. Uh, I'm really excited today to be joined uh, by two really, uh, really fascinating speakers from uh, different angles, right? Uh, one from an uh, almost operator side of things and one from an investment uh, side of things to speak about the topic today. I'll ask them to introduce themselves uh, shortly, uh, but I thought it was also good just to mention why we do these webinars. Um, so it may seem that uh, <laughs> Lian did a bit of marketing. Uh, that's part of my KPI, so she has to do the marketing. But the real reason is not actually around marketing. It's really just we found that over time that there's some interesting topics that don't get as much bandwidth uh, out there. Um, and But yet they're very important uh, for running a business, uh, for running an investment uh, advisory business. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're critical concepts. And so we've taken it upon ourselves to try and spotlight some of these topics. So if you look at some of the previous webinars we've had, we've had topics uh, like you know cash management, uh, especially this was a very well attended one, which was during COVID. And we use financial models just to try and illustrate to entrepreneurs how they can try to create different scenarios to better manage their cash, to, make their ex to better extend the runway and so forth. We've had uh, topics like strategy uh, during uh, COVID times, so like just how to think about that. And you always bring some really exciting speakers to try and share some of these thoughts. So we're really hoping that you're going to get something out of this uh, that you can use uh, tomorrow <laughs> when you or maybe after this call 
uh, immediately just to try and improve uh, the way you do things in whichever organization you're from. So feel very welcome uh, and I will get started. And I'm gonna start with uh, Astuti and just ask you, Astuti, can you we just introduce yourself, uh, what you do, your background, uh, ETC, before you move to Raga. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, my name is Astuti Sharma. I work for Ascent Africa. Um, uh, some of you may know us. Uh, currently we have about $200 million assets under management. So we're basically a private equity uh, manager that, that invests on behalf of, of our investors. Um, our investors are the likes of IFC, um, you know, North France, CDC, basically uh, government funded institutions from, from the likes of uh, Europe, states, et cetera. Um, we have offices across three countries right now. Um, so Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya, but we also look at Rwanda and Tanzania. Um, we're a lot like Investia in the sense that we look at all sectors, uh, we, we find everything interesting. Um, so, so we like to look at all sectors other than um, you know, prohibited sectors like mining or real estate or, or a few others um, that, that are not um, in governance uh, with, with our investors, especially those that are you know, um, high risk in terms of ESG, ESG matters, which is basically environmental, social and, and governance matters. Um, so that's, that's the background of Ascent. Uh, I personally uh, have been in private equity for about six years now. Um, uh, prior to this, I, I was working for a fund that you may or may not have heard of. It, it was called Fanisi. Um, and it, it, you know, it, was, it was one of the investors in Halton's and, and the schools and Hillcrest and you know, some of these names that I think you could relate to. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for, for inviting me, Stephen. I'm ha happy to discuss today. Thank you, Astuti. Um, Raghav, uh, over to you. Hi, Stephen. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Raghav Gandhi. I'm the Chief Investment Officer at Acorn Holdings. Um, Acorn, as some of you might be aware, is uh, a, uh, I guess, a leading developer of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, rental housing. Uh, our uh, initial focus has been in uh, purpose-built student accommodation, where we are currently offering about 3,800 beds. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a platform that's been developed over the last uh, five years. Um, and over time, we will be expanding into uh, other product segments. Uh, uh, personally, uh, I've been a real estate professional for uh, now over 15 years, uh, worked across a number of emerging markets, um, and uh, worked across uh, the value chain as well, from uh, fundraising to investments to um, strategy, and then also uh, development management as well. So, um, yeah, uh, kind of uh, glad to be part of the call and uh, happy to share the insights. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Raghav. And maybe just uh, starting with you, um, you know, how do you use financial models? I mean, you mentioned your 3,800 beds uh, so far. Uh, I would imagine that uh, you've come across financial models as you're sort of like building out your portfolio to this size. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, financial models kind of uh, uh, for us uh, transcend a number of uh, uh, work streams, activities that we do. Um, obviously for us, uh, they're important at the um, kind of business planning stage as well for, for an organization. Um, so putting together, you know, the when, when we're speaking to uh, investors, uh, strategic investors, and we want to uh, convey to them, you know, the growth potential uh, for uh, our business model, um, you know, and a, a, a long-term business plan is extremely critical. And that is typically, you know, you can have a, uh, obviously a kind of a PowerPoint uh, to uh, enunciate the, the strategy behind it. But then on top of that, you also have to convey uh, uh, the, the numbers, which is, you know, for folks like Astuti, who, who's a private equity professional, you know, their, their focus is on the numbers, the hard facts, not the wishy-washy stuff that I like to talk about. So, uh, so yeah, so, so you know, we, we, uh, we always complement kind of the strategic story uh, with, uh, with numbers. That's where financial models come in at a kind of, like I said, an organization business plan level. But then, of course, then you get into the nitty gritty. Uh, you mentioned it as well, Stephen, when you're talking about the buildings that are offering those 3,800 beds, as in when, you know, we look at, we're obviously uh, always on the lookout for fresh land parcels. And that means that you're assessing a land parcel for its 
individual feasibility, it's individual viability for a uh, development. And that then requires a project specific financial model uh, to be uh, played out. Um, and you know the, the, those are the kind of two main areas uh, uh, where we where we work with uh, models. I'm sure there's a lot more, but uh, those are the two main ones that I can introduce at this stage. Yeah, um, uh, thank, uh, thanks for that. And like what you mentioned, right? The operational side of things, just to make sure that uh, you know you're making the right uh, choices from a business planning perspective, uh, from just sort of like the, the assets that you're uh, putting into place to be able to build uh, you know, your student accommodation and the whole idea of interacting with the investors. So Astuti, uh, I'm going to ask you the same question and uh, maybe also ask you, you know, what kind of models do you like? Which one don't you like as you're answering that question? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, like like Raghav said, we're not the you know the the other side the other side, um, and and uh, not only do we have to sort of create our own models. Um, so so the way we use our financial model um, throughout our investment process um, and also exit. So so just a bit of uh, once we've invested in a company, we after we we sort of you know stay in the company for five to seven years, and we think that we've. Um, you know, contributed enough or created enough value, we do have an exit timeline, which means that we have to exit the company um, to, to, to a third party or, or to, the, to the other shareholder and, and you know, make our return and move. Um, so throughout the entire process, we're actually, you know, from the initial stage, building a financial model to sort of review, uh, like Raghav said, you know, the, the operational capability and feasibility of the business model. Um, and, and also during exit, um, so, so once we've sort of, you know, accomplished what, what we sort of envisioned uh, in, in the business, um, it's important that we review whether we actually achieve what, what, you know, what, what we had set out to do, um, and also then interact with investors. So we put, we put, we, we put our, you know, selves through what we put the company initially. Um, so, you know, initially we're asking them questions on how is this model going to work? You know, it's easy to put in numbers into the Excel sheet, but, but what about actual um, realistic achievement. Uh, and that's what we go through when we're, when we're exiting the company. So it's important that we um, make sure that our financial models are absolutely A, realistic, uh, and, and B, sort of, you know, talk, talk to what the, what the party wants to also, also review. Um, you, asked, you asked a very interesting question about, you know, what kind of models um, we like. Uh, I, I personally think that models that are simple to understand um, you know, flexible um, to update uh, and, and change, and you know, those that are the most uh, relevant to to the business or or the sector that we're looking at are are actually our favorite because um, it's a bit difficult to update or um, you know change something. I mean, when we when we're looking at investment, you build all the good numbers on Excel, um, and you know. You, it, Excel gives you whatever you, you would like for, for it to give you, uh, but the flexibility and simplicity of the model then actually help you change things um, as you move along, because uh, I'm sure there'll be a number of adjustments that come once, once you're in the business or once the, when the business is actually taken off. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, and I like what you mentioned, the two aspects around sort of like, uh, you know, looking at a financial model. Uh, the first is, um, is does Excel make sense? And the two is does the business make sense? <laughs> and Raga, maybe just throw, throw this back back at you. How do you differentiate between those two aspects? Because at times Excel is just what it is. Uh, you put your inputs. Uh, how do you try to differentiate between those two aspects? I kind of differentiate between what is realistic and not. Yes. Uh, so your financial model, right? Uh, yeah. So the financial model uh, can post something for you. And I guess the key question is. If it doesn't make sense, is it does it make not sense not make sense because of the assumptions, or because of the Excel construction, right? I know these are couple questions to a certain extent. Yeah, I think I mean I, I guess that you know you have to look at it on a case by case basis, right? It's very difficult to turn around and say that it has to be one or the other. Um, and uh, there's a couple of things that I'm sure everyone, particularly you know everyone at Investia, will be familiar with, but you know, what I learned from my days in investment banking is that uh, modeling is an art, not a science. And, uh, and the second one is garbage in, garbage out. So in a way, both of those speak to the points that you've just raised, which is that um, I think, you know, if we speak about the assumptions, um, 
there's obviously always a need to, to have substantiation for what are the assumptions that you're putting in. Um, you know, I guess it depends on what sector you're in or what work you do. Um, the good thing for us now is that we're at a stage where because we've you know, been in this space for a number of years, we have um, the, uh, like I said, the, the validation of our assumptions, right? So we are confident that, um, uh, you know, what it takes to build, uh, how much it costs to take a building, uh, to, to build a building and, uh, you know, how much we can charge uh, in terms of revenues, um, uh, in terms of rental rates. So if uh, someone was to decide that they wanted to try something else, then you know that, okay, I have a template that works that I know is what is a re reflection of reality. You know, if someone's decided that they want to get carried away and maybe show that, you know, uh, there's there can be a potential 10% reduction in construction costs, then you can kind of go back to them and say, okay, look, why is this? What is it that we're, you know, what what is it that we're getting at? Um, um, so for us, I mean, I think the benefit that we have is that vis-a-vis -vis our um, uh, kind of our project specific models, now we have a set template um, so in that sense, it's much more about questioning the assumptions, not the model architecture, because that has been obviously validated over time. I think when it comes to the architecture, like, for instance, we also create new models here and there. You know, um, I have a, a number of uh, fantastic individuals as team members who, who do amazing uh, modeling. Um, and, and obviously that's something that uh, I can also thank Investia for. Um, but, you know, uh, the, you know, I think, I, think, I think there are always kind of telltale signs for, uh, especially when you've been uh, in the investment space and you've worked with models yourself where you can kind of tell that uh, there might be something wrong in the, uh, in, the, in the architecture of the model itself that you know, the, the, the output is not quite reflecting um, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, what the inputs are being put in. The inputs, inputs make sense, but it's the output that's not following through. So that typically points to uh, an issue with the architecture. Um, you know, when, like I said, sometimes I think it's tough to uh, convey, but when you've been uh, working on models, you also know where um, where the typical areas are that you need to go to where there might be an issue. Um, um, and then, you know, uh, again, uh, Stuti can probably speak to this more knowledgeably, but, you know, for me, um, what I like to do is just take, um, you know, one segment of the model um, or a few, a couple of segments of the model just to test out, um, you know, how it works out um, by changing some of the uh, assumptions how does it really follow through? Do those changes make sense? Uh, you know, that's how you can kind of also test out the, the architecture itself. Um, uh, th thanks, Raghavan. I like, uh, you know, what you're saying in terms of uh, having a certain amount of experience in this space that at times you know what makes sense and what doesn't. Uh, but I guess as Tutti for you, you said, you know, you look at different sectors, right? Uh, yeah. And I guess the challenge with that is that if an entrepreneur brings you, you know, a, a model, it's a school, it's, a, you know, it's a health institution, whatever it might be, a manufacturing plant, and they tell you, you know, we're expecting that over the next couple of years, you're going to make 10x your money. Uh, you're a private equity, you probably, I mean, if you get that, you, you like it, but that's not what you usually target for. If anything, that scares you to a certain extent, because it has to come with some risk, right? How do you make sure that, uh, or, or how do you go around uh, trying to validate the financial model? to make sure that, uh, you know, the 10X is actually achievable. Uh, and, you know, to the two points that uh, Raghav brought, the model architecture on one side uh, and the assumptions on the other hand. So, uh, you know, um, as, as much as we, we receive financial models from, from companies and entrepreneurs and, you know, we sort of review them and things like that, I think it's a good practice for us to build our own models as well. Um, given that we, you know, have about 11 portfolio companies across different sectors now, I think we would like to say we have a little bit, a little bit of understanding of how, you know, for example, a manufacturing operation would look like, how schools would look like, how now, now we're also looking at healthcare, so how that would look like. So a good way to test um, what, what the entrepreneur sort of gives you is also building your own model. Um, and, and, you know, Raghav said that he's, he's, it's, it's very nice that, you know, they, they already have certain templates where 
where they can go and check the you know whether whether the assumptions make sense and things like that we have to build a model each time you're looking at a new investment um and and so so that sort of strengthens our skills but it also means that we're supposed to be extremely careful you know when we're looking at each sector so for example uh we would we would be looking at at a at a healthcare sort of institution, you know, for example, a hospital, and 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 the entrepreneur would say, we're going from 100 to 200 beds, um, and the, you know, this is the revenue that we're looking at. Um, it's it's in our interest to build our own to be able to assess whether, you know, the feasibility of of firstly achieving that. Um, in 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 growth, I think a big part that that people forget is the investment that sort of required to to drive you there. Um, so just checking, you know, whether um, the investment that, they're, they're, for example, they're looking for and, and the numbers that they want to achieve, whether they sort of talk to each other. Um, the other thing is, there's this very interesting thing that, you know, we, that is part of our process, which is, which we call the commercial due diligence aspect of things. So when we build our financial model, um, you know, we don't claim to be experts in every sector. So we, we engage experts um, to do what we call commercial due diligence. So whether it's school, we'll, you know, bring in an educator, whether it's, whether it's a healthcare institution, we usually have doctors on board who, who you know, sort of tell us, hey, I don't think you need four ICU beds for a facility that size, for example. Um, and yet our financial model would say, we'll build in four, you know, ICU beds without, you know, and we'll, we'll sort of, you know, this is how much revenue we'll make and things like that, you know, like Raghav said initially, garbage in, garbage out. So if, if you just put in a lot of assumptions saying that we're going to achieve this and that, I think it's important that you check with experts whether that's actually, you know, possible on ground. So in our commercial due diligence, it's always very nice to get a sense check. Of, of what we're looking at. And, and you know, more, more often than not, we've, we've found that we're either too aggressive or, you know, sometimes we're being too conservative on, on the growth that we're looking at, for example. On your question around architecture and, you know, assumptions, the, like he said, and I, and I think he said a very important point, the easiest way to check whether the model is A, accurate, uh, so integrity of the model and also feasibility is to change the assumptions. So, you know, it would actually be able to help you identify whether your formulas have been dragged through, for example, uh, you know, whether there are any fundamental basic errors um, that you can sort of check initially. Uh, and of course, of course, the assumptions, I mean, I'm, I'm sure uh, the experts, even before the experts tell you, you should be able to make your own um, assessment on the assumptions that you have. Um, it, it helps that, you know, we can always in our team, um, you know, we have different people who've worked on, on different things. Um, and, and you've helped us quite a bit as well, uh, you know, train, train some of the team members. So, so it's, it's, it's now become a skill that, that we're trying to, you know, develop in terms of when you build a model, um, what, are, what are the key things you look at? And I think there's something that um, the team at that point in time had sort of, uh, you know, identified Investia had taught us something very important. It's to do common size analysis. So as soon as you do your common size analysis, it'll tell you, hey, something has been 10% of your revenue for the past five years, but now it's 50%. Um, it, it immediately highlights something, you know, an area of concern or, or an area that you probably need to look at. So, so there, there are like multiple things you know, uh, multiple sort of range of things that you can do. Um, but those are some of the things that, you know, are, are come to mind uh, right now. Uh, thanks, Astuti. And uh, I like that point of uh, the common size. And uh, just uh, in case someone is not aware what a common size uh, analysis is, is really just, uh, you know, taking your financials and putting them in percentages. Uh, so the profit and loss statement, making sure that everything or calculating everything as a percentage of sales, uh, the balance sheet, everything as a percentage of uh, total assets, and the cash flow statement, everything as a percentage of sales. And that gives you a very good picture when you're trying to appreciate the financials you're looking at. Uh, Raghav, I want to just uh, move on a bit here and just ask, there's some two terms that I use uh, commonly, you know, financial model audits, financial model reviews. Uh, first of all, what, what are they before you get to? Do you do them? Do you think they add value? Um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I am technically qualified to answer that question. I think that I suspect that that's probably something that you do more, uh, 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 let's say from a uh, qualified perspective. Uh, I guess for me, I mean, just an assumption, and maybe this also answers the second part of the question, given that I'm not clear what it, exactly what they mean, it shows you how much I do it. But um, I think an audit, I guess, is uh, uh, a, a uh, let's say a, an assessment of, uh, 
you know, uh, the workings and the architecture of the, the financial model. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and I assume it's done by an external party. Uh, um, uh, uh, financial review maybe could be is something that I would do internally, uh, you know, when, uh, when we evaluate uh, transactions. And it's something that, uh, you know, one of the team members, uh, one of my colleagues kind of uh, brings along an investment proposal. Then we also sit through the model as well. That would be my supposition, but I could be wrong. And I'm happy to be proven so as well. Raghav, I apologize. This was not meant to be that those rapid fire exam questions by mm -hmm. investor. Uh, you know, with some of these things, I find that uh, they they use the terminologies I find uh, which I used, and I find uh, that uh, especially for um, you know certain organizations, they you know they play around with these uh, terms or they want to you know do a model audit, model review. Uh, but I don't know, Astuti, whether you want to weigh in on the same topic. And I, uh, Raghav, just FYI. I think you're already on 80%. So um, <laughs> I, I also think um, that, you know, I, uh, I agree completely that the audit, I think, is usually done by, by a third party. So I, I'll just explain how we, we currently do it. Um, firstly, from my understanding, a model audit is, is part of the review process. Uh, so a review is, is sort of like, you know, it, it, it includes, it's a larger scope of work, it includes everything. So you'd look at, you know, the um, achievability of the business, you know, whether the business model is making sense, uh, basically everything that, that you look at. But an audit, I think, focuses on the integrity of the of the model and you know just making sure that the basics of, of the errors or you know how the formulas have been placed. I think Leon at the at the beginning mentioned the fast principles. Um, so so the audit sort of tries to tries to cover all of that. Uh, but a review then you know audit is also part of the review. Um, currently we sort of you know we we do it internally and externally. Um, I think Raghav said that you know financial uh, sort of model review is something that they do internally, which is exactly what what we do as well. Um, so if I prepare something, it, you know, uh, whichever partner, we have four partners in the firm. So whichever partner, um, you know, is working on the deal and, and feels like he has, he has enough time, we'll sort of look at whether the model makes sense, which is the initial review aspect of things. Um, and in certain cases, we have had, you know, uh, engagements with third parties like, like yourselves to come and just make sure that the, the audit makes sense. So for example, um, you know, whether the formulas have been dragged across, whether, you know, the sheets are linked, whether um, in general, the integrity of the of the model, you know, um, holds, holds good value. And we can actually make a decision um, using that because, you know, it's, it's only an Excel sheet at the beginning of an investment, um, but, but it, it carries a lot of dollars at the back of it. So, so this whole review and, and, and audit uh, for, for us is a really, really big um, sort of aspect of of investing as well. Th thanks, Astuti. And uh, maybe just to create a bit more context on those two terminologies, because I think they, they, they use loosely, but they mean very different things. So, you know, the audit is, you know, you get an external party, uh, they review the whole financial model cell by cell, uh, they review the assumptions, the tax assumptions, everything else, and they give you a report. And they tell you, we can guarantee you that you can use this financial model uh, based on the assumptions you've given and based on the construction, it's good to go. And so if you can imagine then if you're doing a project finance uh, deal for argument's sake, um, and you're sort of like gonna commit the dollars that you spoke about uh, Astuti, right? Uh, the last thing you want is after you guys have made the investment, six months in you're told, oh, sorry, sorry, we did forget one zero or the tax assumptions are not right. And the returns are actually not 15%, the returns are 10%, because then you know, you, you've lost a lot of dollars of that. Uh, and I guess the, the review then tends to almost focus much more on the model integrity uh, and doesn't go as deep as uh, the, the audit on the other side. Uh, because, you know, with the audit, you have to get a certificate. With the review, then it's, it just gives you comfort, but uh, it will go through cell by cell if you want to go through by cell, but not really into the assumptions uh, that uh, you've created because then uh, some of those assumptions you've just been given, just take them as is. Um, but then just to move the discussion and, and Raghav, uh, back to you, do you have any horror stories of where you thought, you know, we're done with this model, maybe an analyst has done a financial model, uh, you've reviewed it, 
Uh, I'm sure you can tell us the horror stories of the projects that you've done and then sort of like six months in when construction is going on, uh, you're like, oh my gosh, what did we do? But if you can, please feel free. Because at times people, uh, people don't think about this terminology as just the impact when I excel more than some. Do you have any horror stories that you could share? I mean, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if I would go as far as to say horror stories. I think, uh, um, you know, you look, I, I, I'm not, I don't know if I should be saying this on this call, but on this forum, but I, I don't necessarily believe that every model is perfect, 100% perfect, right? You're always going to have some glitches uh, somewhere along the way. Sometimes people hard code stuff, you know, because that's required and, and then you forget it when you move on and, you know, you, you kind of, uh, uh, but I, I feel like as long as kind of in the initial phase, you know, you do some of that robustness assessment that we've spoken about, uh, you know, where you're kind of testing the waters, you're seeing, does it, does it follow through? Uh, hey, look, I've just changed some material assumptions, but the model's not actually making any, it's not making any difference. Um, you know, as long as you've kind of been a little thorough at that stage, you know, um, I don't think a model itself should throw out a horror story. The horror story usually I feel happens in actuality, right? Where it's the reality doesn't reflect what the model was saying. Yes, again, a model is is something on paper. It's on a, uh, it's on a computer screen. It's not, uh, you know, a, reality doesn't always play out exactly as it is on a spreadsheet. So, uh, you know, sometimes you might find that, oh, this project is not, uh, you know, exactly faring the way that you expect it to, or you budgeted for an 18 month construction period, but then the contractor, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of had cash flow issues and therefore has not been able to work for six months, or there was some issue that came up with statutory approvals that put a stops sign on the site. And therefore, you know, I think that's where horror stories come through. I think, uh, 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 I don't. I don't uh, have nightmares about models. Uh, I, I think that's. Uh, I've got other areas that I need to have nightmares about uh, rather than a spreadsheet. Yeah. Yeah. And Raghav, I, I hope that's because uh, you know your team is really good uh, on the modeling side. Uh, but let me ask the same question <laughs> to Astuti. Uh, Astuti, do you have any, I guess, model-specific horror stories? Because I, I guess execution. Uh, you know, I like this quote: "Never confuse a clear line of sight for a clear line of execution." Right. At times you know exactly what you should do and you can see it, but once you go to market, you realize that you know the market changes and so you can't do things don't work out as you expected, right? But as to do you have any horror stories on the modeling side where the model told you this is a clear line of sight, but then uh, you know when you so once you start executing the clear line of sight, you realize, oh, actually, that was not a clear line of sight, and it's because the model told me that something completely different. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, and I will not take names, but uh, we were working on um, a, on a financial model for for one of one of the potential investments. Um, and you know, when you when you build models with strict timelines, and uh, you know, in the middle of the night when you're trying to balance your balance sheet and things like that, and, and I'm sure Raghav's analysts will sort of relate to this. Um, and, and you know, you have strict timelines, and you're building something which, you know, it's, it's important to finish rather than make sure that it, that it sort of, you know, aligns with, with, uh, with the general strategy of, of what you were trying to achieve in the first place. Um, there was an instance of, you know, something um, not sort of a, a clear omission of, let's say, HQ costs. Um, so it was included in the first few years, but in the last few years, it sort of, you know, if the formula wasn't dragged or um, a clear, you know, increment wasn't wasn't put in place or something like that something as small as that um you know said our returns would be about um an irr which is an internal rate of return of about 18 percent and things like that and um at some point after investment when, you, when you're reviewing the case again you're saying hey we were supposed to make crazy amounts of money in, in these years you know what happened um and and, and that's when everybody realized what had actually happened um, and, and I think at that point in time, I remember, you know, getting you in, on board and trying to review some of the things um, and making sure that, you know, whatever we have, at least there, there are no additional sort of areas that have been skipped. Um, 
because it's it's important to note that when when investors evaluate uh, what you had promised to them on day one, um, you know aspects that are out of your control, like you know maybe you know like like Raghav mentioned the regulatory approvals, the the general market. You know, I mean, COVID, no one anticipated, so I'm sure our investors don't don't hold us to you know the financial models we we, we submitted at the beginning of 2020 to what we have now. Um, but but general sort of you know something that was missed out. Um, by, by the team or something that was, you know, overlooked in terms of expenses or revenues, um, I, I think is extremely critical. So uh, we, we then sort of, you know, incorporated an, an extra review uh, process and, you know, engaging third parties and things like that, because we understand um, that by, at the end of the day, it's an Excel sheet, you know, like Raghav said, it's something, uh, whatever you input is exactly what it will give you. Um, so, so there is some sort of an extra pair of eyes that I think always helps. And I think there's one point you've mentioned that I really like, uh, the idea that uh, there's some uh, parts uh, of any project which are outside your control, right? And that those which are within your control. Uh, and I would dare argue that the Excel is within your control, right? Because <laughs> it's something you build, it's something you can review and so forth. But what happens once you go to market, uh, you know, that, 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 you know, it's only anybody's guess what happens. Um, I mean, uh, you've mentioned regulation and how those kind of things affect uh, different projects. Um, maybe, uh, Raghav, just to uh, come back to this, one point that you made that I thought was a really good uh, point, and it was this idea that not all models are perfect, right? And I think it's such a good, I mean, we build financial models, and one like we're telling people, uh, even when we do our training, is the first thing you're sure when you finish a financial model is that it's wrong. <laughs> Right. It's wrong because uh, one, you can't expect anything that you put there to happen. Otherwise, you know, everybody will be coming to you for advice every single day. Uh, but then it's wrong also from the perspective of the construction. It's good to go in with that mentality that uh, there may be some mistakes. And so you need to have a process in place in terms of being able to review to make sure that then the things within your control, as we're just talking about, you've been able to uh, address. So uh, just to get a sense from you, because you, it seems you use more than quite a bit at Acon. What kind of process do you have in place of just ensuring that you know the Excel that's within your control, at least you're I don't know, 99 percent sure that uh, there's not uh, any issues that are within the spreadsheet? I think I mean I, I mean what I recommend and generally what I follow is kind of having that maker checker type ethos, right? Uh, um, and it's not just one checker. I mean, you know, typically what I do is, uh, uh, as terms of in terms of a process, is layer in a number of kind of checks and balances. You obviously have one person who creates a model, and and you know, um, uh, what we have to work with is that everyone makes mistakes. It's only natural. It's not something that anyone needs to be crucified for. Um, and uh, but then what you need to do is have um, you know, the additional layers of vetting that enable uh, uh, kind of the, or that ensure uh, that, uh, that robustness of the structure and the, uh, and the composition of the model. So typically like, uh, you know, uh, I would say particularly kind of for new models and extensive models, what we'll have is, you know, you have the analyst preparing the model, then the person that uh, the associate that they report to will, will do the check. Um, um, I then like to also, I mean, depending, I guess, on the size of the team, you know, we might have another level of associate who can then do a cross check, who's maybe someone who's independent from uh, the team that is actually working on that assignment and that model. So you have kind of a neutral or independent third party eye. Um, and then um, uh, uh, kind of uh, what uh, also tends to happen is that I'll do a separate session as well, uh, where um, depending on the time that is available, either you know I'll 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 uh, go through the model myself, or what uh, what I'll do is I'll ask the team uh, to take me through the model. So we kind of uh, lock ourselves away for about one one and a half hours, and uh, we kind of you know they take me through the flow of the model. Then I'm like, okay, let's let's test out a few things. Let's see how it goes. Um, uh, you know, if there's uh, some limited knowledge I have here and there, I might 
uh, I might ask them how some things were computed uh, and to see how that was computed. You know, so you kind of, uh, uh, like I said, you know, you've got, you've got, I guess, in there about at least three layers of checking that take place, which uh, hopefully by the end of it, um, you get to the right, uh, right product and the right output. Um, if you don't, despite that, then, you know, I guess we need to look at ourselves. Uh, thank you, Raghav, and I like that sort of like the free layer because yes, that does capture quite a bit of uh, stuff. And, and maybe before I come back to you, I'll ask you the same question just to understand what kind of process you have. I want to ask everybody on the call, if you have any questions, kindly just type them, type them in in the chat and I'll pick them up. Uh, I want to start opening up to questions from everybody uh, else. Um, uh, if they're about uh, the topic that you're talking about, the, the, the better. Uh, if they're very, if they're related, yes. If they're very outside, we may not uh, take them at this point. Uh, but just looking forward to your questions. Um, uh, Astuti, uh, what kind of process do you have in place uh, for making sure that uh, you know, your model at least uh, is within your control and does make sense? Actually, quite similar to what Raga just mentioned about you know having layers of, of review. Um, we um, you know we're quite a lean team, um, so it's 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 more often than not a bit difficult for for um many people to sort of you know look at your model before before it's something that's presented to the IEC so what we try to do is at, at a minimum at least two people um will check uh so it, it could be you know somebody at, at, at your same level um but you know somebody who's probably had experience in the sector or or has worked on on a similar transaction before um, uh, some of our partners are extremely technical, uh, you know, technically gifted, actually. So, so they, um, you know, have, have actually been an analyst at some point, and therefore they, they understand, uh, you know, how, how that mind sort of works, and therefore they also um, uh, review the, the model uh, before it is actually presented. Um, in some cases uh, where we think that it is a bit um, complex and, you know, requires or, or the deal structure is extremely complex, uh, we then would have, you know, a, a third party sort of come in and, and, and you know, audit the model. But after, after our team has already looked at it so that we're not, you know, um, sort of giving a completely raw model out, uh, but something that has sort of been thought through uh, by, by, the, by the deal team involved, basically. Uh, thanks uh, for that. Um, I'm seeing there's one question that just come in, but uh, let me just ask this last question. And uh, um, uh, Raghav, uh, I think one of the tips and tricks, I started this by saying at the beginning that we'd like people to live with sort of like very actionable things that they can do tomorrow. I guess one is to have multiple layers uh, of review. Uh, I would imagine two is what you've just mentioned, just assuming that your model has problems. <laughs> Um, I think three for me, just thinking about what you just mentioned is knowing that part of it could be an aspect with the assumptions, part of it could be an, as uh, an aspect with the construction. Uh, but just uh, taking it uh, forward, maybe even from an Excel perspective, are there any other tips and tricks uh, top of mind uh, that you found over time that you'd want to tell someone, you know, uh, if you want to make sure that your model at least uh, makes sense, uh, which helps in terms of investment decision, uh, think about one, two, three. Is there anything you'd like to add there? Um, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, um, this might sound a little nerdy, but, uh, 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 but you know, what I, uh, what I actually sometimes appreciate is just uh, looking at other people's models um, uh, to kind of learn from them. Um, for me, uh, uh, there's always, uh, again, the assumption is that there's always better ways of doing things than what you're doing. Um, so to the extent that you can learn from others, uh, there's no harm in that. Um, uh, um, I think, uh, uh, you know, um, the, I, I would say that every once in a while, um, you, like, you know, we spoke about kind of having a project or a modeling template, right, for our project's evaluation. But um, uh, what I also encourage as an exercise is, is to actually sometimes redo uh, uh, the model template uh, or create, create a project uh, feasibility model out of scratch and see if it spits out the same results as, uh, as uh, you know, your uh, template that you've been working on because um, things evolve, uh, you know, there can be better ways or simpler ways of, uh, of uh, work putting together a spreadsheet. Um, 
and um, I think it's 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 always important to kind of um, keep one on one's toes. Uh, so don't assume that you know just because this was set up like a year ago, it's gonna uh, work for perpetuity. Um, I think it's always important to kind of uh, freshen things up as well. Um, and you know that also it kind of naturally should happen because you get new team members, uh, team members with different skill set, different ways of thinking. So it's always important to kind of um, yeah, uh, just uh, uh, I think uh, revisit what you've been doing. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. Um, Asuchi, any other uh, tricks that you've picked out uh, over time? Um, and at the risk of sounding very technical, um, I think uh, something that I've learned over, over the years is that your assumptions are your heart of, of your model. Uh, more often than not, people spend very little time on your assumptions and, and you know, more time on making the model look pretty or uh, making sure that it's the most complex model with the most you know, um, extravagant formulas. Um, but, but like I said, initially, the simpler it is, the better. Um, and, and if you spend enough time on your assumptions, then everything sort of, you know, would, would fall into play because the assumptions is where you make or sort of uh, break the model. I think the other thing that um, Raghav also just mentioned is be like, be comfortable updating the model, um, you know, uh, from, from now, now and, you know, whenever you sort of review or, or relook at the model. In terms of, um, and another, I think, technical point that comes to mind is has have fewer sheets. Um, you know, uh, it's it's I, I like simple models because then you can you know they're, they're quite flexible. Um, you're able to update it. Your partners who who are not you know that technical also understand it. So you know every every member of the team should be able to understand understand what what you're sort of looking at. Um, there's something I mentioned initially about the common size and you know quickly picking out what sort of, you know, makes sense and what doesn't. Um, what helps in, in our team is to standardize models um, because everybody has such a different way of, of, ha of working. Um, in, in, in future, if I was to sort of leave a cent, um, the team should be able to still, you know, look at my model and say, you know, or at least understand what, what my thought process at that point in time was. It's difficult to sort of, you know, have cookie cutter where all models look the same um, because you know we're we're so different from each other, but um, a, a more or less standard approach um, to how we you know envision or build our models uh, helps also in in continuity um, going forward. Uh, thanks, and uh, I like that idea of you know uh, standardizing things as much as you can, uh, because then it removes quite a bit of the errors, and it you know at least your brain doesn't have to work very hard, right? Yeah, you know what you're gonna see. Uh, and so then when you look at it, you very much just focus on the content as opposed to always, you know, using more bandwidth to figure out what am I looking at uh, from the beginning. Uh, but then on that point, there's someone who's asked a question here, and I'm going to make it a bit wider. I think this is Victor Kiprono. Uh, how do you audit a model that does not follow a certain uh, standard, such as the FAST standard, right? Uh, and I guess it goes to that question. Uh, let's, I mean, FAST standard is what we use, uh, flexible, appropriate, structured, and transparent. But I guess it goes to that question of, you're used to your own templates. You've created something that works really well for you, right? Uh, but then you get something that uh, is different and you don't have enough time to rebuild using your own standard. Yeah. And that's what I'm going to start with you here. Uh, how do you then uh, audit that financial model to make sure it makes sense? So, um, uh, like I said, we're in the process of standardizing and we try as much as to standardize, but currently, uh, you know, even as we speak, our models are so different and, and not all of them are, are, are sort of prepared using the FAST standards. Um, I think what we've sort of realized is that having a sheet where you pick whatever your quick analysis is. So for example, I think everybody, um, you know, tries to get lost in the model when you go into the details, but, but you know, when something is not prepared according to the standards, it's always good to look at, I would say, um, the assumptions sheet, because then um, it's, it's easier to understand what the thought process of the, of the preparer or the, or the maker was, um, even if they haven't highlighted you know, what is hard coded and what isn't and things like that. Hopefully they have followed some basic rules of, of, of modeling, which should then help you sort of assess, you know, the thought process that, that sort of came, came um, to their mind when they were preparing the model. Um, uh, Raghav, I don't know that you have any other sort of like uh, question, uh, also any other response to the same question, but I'm also gonna ask you, there's a question here from 
Chacha, uh, Verkesh Chacha. Um, I don't know that you want to take a stab on that, which is how you structure an LBO, uh, how do you go through financing and how best uh, would it work in Kenya? Uh, if you're comfortable, you can run with each other. Is It's a bit outside, but I just thought it's an interesting one. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I wouldn't want to give a qualified answer on that one, uh, uh, Stephen, given that uh, I've not been in the LBO space. I mean, I, I imagine that uh, nevertheless, uh, I mean, this is just uh, kind of hazarding uh, some rationale, uh, but that, you know, an LBO is obviously primarily focused around the financing structure, which is uh, that it is uh, primarily reliant on, on, on debt. Um, but, uh, you know, and obviously our models, uh, when we do project uh, feasibilities, they do include uh, debt in their financing. Um, but, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I should actually uh, 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 provide any more further inputs on that one. That one. Uh, anything in terms of how to uh, check out uh, a model that you've not, uh, is not as far the templates or the structures that you're used to? I, I mean, like I said before, I mean, we work very much with new models as well, uh, um, you know, all the time. Um, it's only on the projects that uh, we uh, we have uh, uh, kind of the templates that are there. But, in you know, just to give you an example, I don't know if uh, some of you are aware, but, you know, we launched a retail aggregator platform platform called VUCA, which enables people to invest in the income REIT that we launched uh, last year. But when we had to put together the business plan for that, we, you know, we, we came up with a, a fresh, very much a customized model for it because it has very different uh, kind of components to it than a, than a project. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I mean, I, I don't want to kind of belabor the point, uh, you know, it, uh, it just, Kind of, we we just followed the same approach that we did before, uh, which is that uh, um, I, I do agree with uh, a lot with us today. Actually, uh, I should have mentioned it myself that I think sometimes we fall into the trap of having an overly complex model, you know, too many kind of interconnectedness, and then you get into circular references and all that kind of stuff, and then people get freaked out. Um, I think the simpler uh, that one can keep a model with as fewer spreadsheets, uh, which also spreadsheets that follow through. So there's, you know, it's kind of like following a logic, right? Um, and I think that's always key. As, as long as there's a logic that you can exhibit, um, uh, I think that's that's what makes a successful uh, successful model. Stephen, I think you're on mute. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, I was saying I, I like the point on uh, simplicity because, uh, you know, in my earlier days when I would build a financial model, the more complex it was, the better, because it showed how skillful I was. <laughs> Much later, <laughs> I've realized that uh, complex models are not good because if I have to look at them after six months, I'm just like, what was I smoking on that? Because I need to be smoking that today to make sense of what I was building uh, on that specific day. Guys, uh, thank you so much. I'm gonna ask you guys to make some closing remarks. It's fascinating that you could have a conversation on financial models on each and review for a whole hour. Sounds like a very blunt topic, but I, I really like how you've been able to bring it to life through very real examples uh, from your day-to-day -day, uh, you know, experiences. Uh, and for the you know the, the good pointers that uh, you've put out, I think what we will do after this uh, is just to maybe put out a quick uh, blog post uh, or just a quick summary of five key points just to pick out from these uh, as we post the video. But just some closing remarks. Astuti, do you have any closing remarks before we uh, close uh, in the next four minutes? Um, no, just just to thank you. Firstly, um, you know, for for giving us this forum to to share our insights um, and and for the continued, I think, good work that Investia keeps doing um, in helping you know not only our portfolio companies but also us as investors. Um, it's it's actually quite 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 helpful um, on maybe financial modeling and um, you know audit and review. I think um, my my key point would be practice makes perfect so even if, if you're building a model right now and you're, you're not you're taking your you're taking your sweet time um it's not you know up to what you would expect it to be or or, or whatever challenges you're facing i think as as you go on um you know you can be a little easier on yourself and then once you practice quite a few models i think um the you know the uh, reasonability of, of the model and also the integrity i think just keeps keeps improving as you go along 
Thank you, Astuti. Uh, appreciate uh, Practice makes perfect. Don't be too hard uh, on yourself as you're getting started. Raghav? Yeah, uh, no, I, I think uh, it's been uh, it's been a fun session as always. Uh, thank you for uh, you know giving me the opportunity to speak on the forum. Uh, enjoy the conversation. I think the 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 one piece of advice and it probably echoes what's already been uh, spoken uh, that I would give to everyone is that you know um, uh, when you're kind of uh, thinking of putting together a model, um, the the best way to kind of assess. Uh, its effectiveness is to uh, just think that if um, this model was, you know, in the hands of someone, let's say one or two years down the line, would I need to be there in order to take them through it? Um, if it's, you know, got a simple logic uh, uh, and the, the architecture largely follows, you'll find that someone else who is, you know, um, experienced in the financial analysis space will actually be able to follow the model without needing uh, your intervention. And that's when you know you've kind of put together a, an effective, successful model. So that's something that I think anyone should strive for. Yeah, uh, Raghav, I like that point, yeah? Build with the user in mind. Because <laughs> I think modelers have this idea of building with the model in mind, <laughs> which makes it very complex for the user on the other side. Uh, well, we have two minutes to spare, but uh, you know, we, we like keeping the sessions strictly one hour. Um, so if uh, there's no further comments, and I'm not seeing any further comments on the um, on the on, on the uh, chat here, I'm gonna ask everybody just to maybe uh, I'm gonna un uh, un unpin uh, and ask everybody if we just you know show uh, you know appreciation uh, for our speakers by just using the emoticons and uh, doing a simple clap <laughs> now that you can't uh, see each other face to face. Uh, so if we just do a very simple, you know, clap for the, uh, to appreciate uh, our speakers today. Uh, and I'm seeing, yeah, uh, people are appreciating the session. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, thank you Astuti, thank you Raghav. Uh, thank you everybody who's been able to attend. Uh, till the next session, uh, please follow us, uh, follow us on our socials and you'll pick out uh, when you have in the next uh, uh, webinar, which will be in the next uh, two months. Do have a good day. Uh, Thank bye you, bye. everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Stephen. You're welcome. Cheers.